Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rendering server. It's kind of come up in a few videos that I've done in the past and people tend to ask in the comments for like a more detailed explanation or just a little bit more background on, on how to use the rendering server. So I'm going to talk about what it is briefly. I'm going to talk about, you know, how you use it in Godot. I'll show you some simple code later. And I probably most importantly, I'm going to tell you perhaps why you might consider using the rendering server. So when you want to render a whole bunch of objects, you do have some options. You can make a whole bunch of nodes in the scene tree. So those will be mesh instance 3Ds. You have another option of using a multi mesh, right? So that resource goes with the multi mesh instance 3D node. Uh, and this is the one that people tend to jump to a lot, but I don't think people really realize some of the trade offs that are involved in, in multi meshes. The third option is using the rendering server, and that's what I want to focus a bit on in this video. And then there is a fourth option. There's kind of multi mesh, but better. The proton scatter add on, some of you may have heard of that one, does multi mesh chunking and splitting, which really does help some of the issues. So before we really jump in and talk about multi mesh and rendering server, there's a couple of concepts we need to talk about briefly. The first one is level of detail. So, LOD, as you probably have heard about, uh, Godot does this by default when importing GLTF files. I believe it uses the mesh optimizer library under the hood. And so basically what happens is when that little drop down is selected or checkbox for generate LOD, uh, it auto LODs your mesh, meaning it takes your base mesh and it applies a couple levels of decimation basically. And you can see that here in the wireframe a little bit better. And so the auto LOD is pretty good, but it's not very aggressive, which is what we'll see in a minute. And it's very important for reducing poly count in big scenes. The other concept that's very important is frustum calling. And basically, um, it's an extremely basic type of calling that can cut lots of geometry from the scene. So anything that's outside the view frustum from the camera's perspective, and of course, this is with a perspective projection, anything outside of this frustum plus a margin, uh, the renderer is just going to chop from the rendering pipeline, right? So you can cut tons and tons of meshes out of the of, of this kind of view for some, it gets a little bit more complicated when you consider shadows and things like that. But generally speaking, for some calling is basically looking at something that anything that's outside the view for some, it doesn't render. So fun fact about multi meshes, uh, <laughs> you get neither LOD or for some calling. So you have to be careful with it, right? If you just say, Oh, I'm just going to use a multi mesh and put 10,000 instances of my, you know, 30,000 triangle model in there you're going to have some real problems. That's not, that's not going to be runnable on most machines. I don't have a super powerful computer, but we'll see in a second kind of what the difference looks like. So first of all, what actually is the rendering server? Uh, the Godot docs said it better than, than I could here. So the rendering server is the API backend for everything visible. In our case, that means we're going to render some mesh instance 3ds with it, but anything that you see in a game, anything that's visible actually goes through the rendering server. And of course, when you create nodes and put them in the scene tree, they're interacting with this API in the same way. It's just, you're not directly doing it. So why would you actually go for the rendering server? Um, in Godot Forward Plus, you still get intelligent batching of draw calls. It should it should be noted though, in compatibility mode, you won't get that, right? So um, you gotta be a bit careful if you're making games for web, you gotta think about, perhaps think about batching a little bit better. You do get frustum calling, you do get LOD, uh, you skip the overhead associated with the scene tree entirely, and there's some support for multi-threaded functionality. Um, the reason I have an asterisk here is that officially they say that there's not support, but I have messed around with uh, using semaphores and threads properly, having you know different things run in the background while the game is processing, and it seems to be fine. Uh, perhaps there's something I'm missing there, but uh, if you can let me know what your experience with that has been, um, multi-threading and rendering servers and physics servers, in my opinion, make a lot of sense. And that brings us actually a lot closer to how AAA games uh, run. You should treat it like an API. So the, the big, I guess, problem with the rendering server is that you have to manage the state yourself. Um, that means you have to manage like whether something is visible or not. You got to manage their transforms, like where are these objects positioned in space, particularly if they're moving around. And basically the way it works is you have your game logic where you manage all the, the resource IDs associated with these uh, rendering call instances. And then you associate info with those RIDs you could use a dictionary, you could use an array, it's, it's up to you how you manage that. 
but ultimately you just send requests to the rendering server API. It should be a one-way street. You should never try to go the other way. So if we hop over to Godot here, I have a whole bunch of scenes set up where we can kind of explore this a little bit. And the first one I'm going to run actually is just a, a build this building here that has a single node, right? So you kind of sense this is like a bit of a destroyed mesh, um, not super high res, certainly in terms of the texture and everything, but there's, there's a decent amount of detail here um, with the mesh itself. And I thought there was perhaps enough detail in this mesh that we could explore what the auto lod looks like, perhaps for us, I'm calling that type of thing. So if we run this um, scene here, I'm going to turn on FPS. I'm going to turn on process. Um, perhaps we can look at draw calls primitives and that should be pretty good. So I have a basic camera in here that just lets us fly around. Um, and the first thing you might notice is that we've got 138,000 primitives. And if we go to blender, you'll see we only have 34,680. So you may wonder what is going on here? Well, this trips me up occasionally too, but you got to look at your shadow setting. Uh, when you're on PSSM for splits, you basically get your draw count or your primitive count gets multiplied by four. So you go to orthogonal, this basically gets cut in half because we're rendering the object once and then we render the object's shadow from an orthographic perspective from the, from the sun, basically. But that's why we get this draw call count. And if we um, zoom in and out, or if we look away, what do we notice? The draw, the primitives goes to zero. We're getting some nice frustum calling here. It's very, very obvious that the engine is doing this properly. A um, little bit weird there, but uh, generally speaking, we should be able to get frustum calling. Now, some of this weird behavior is what I was talking about with shadows. The, the engine needs to draw a shadow along that line of sight. You don't actually call uh, the whole thing. So the other thing we can kind of look at here is um, LOD, which we see we dropped down 104,000 triangles. If we go out a bit further, we should drop even more. Now we're down to 69,000. And I believe this is the lowest level of LOD that the engine gives. I don't think it goes lower than this. So that's what I was saying. It actually did go lower. So we're down to 34,000. So it's not super aggressive. If you consider how much this is on screen, we should be able to drop that quite a bit more, right? So that's our, that's our one building uh, scene there. Let's take a look at what this looks like with a bunch of nodes, and this is 400 of these uh, buildings. And we can see even in the editor, things are a little bit, I'm not sure if it's coming through on the recording, but things are a bit choppy here. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I have a little um, flyby camera on an animator that we're gonna let, we're just gonna let it run and then kind of observe what happens. So if we jump back to the debugger, we can see now we have a lot of primitives. We have 22 million, but we can see this primitive count is changing quite a lot. Um, we're getting an FPS of, I don't know, somewhere above 60, right? Um, the process time is fluctuating a little bit here. Um, and we can see the draw calls. It's not a single draw call, so there is batching happening, but it's not uh, perfect, right? But we can see the, the primitive count is changing. And that, once again, is due to frustum calling. It's due to LOD and those things kind of combining. Now, the obvious question is, how do, we, how do these numbers compare with the multi-mesh case? So let's go take a look at this multi-mesh example I've got set up. Run current scene. Take a look here. Now, what we notice right away is we are now drawing 55 million primitives um, and actually it jumped up a little bit there. Not really sure why it did that, but we're now at, you know, 69 million primitives and this does not change. Our draw calls are not changing. Uh, we have the one draw call for the base mesh and then the four for the shadows, right? Cause it renders it from four different directions. Um, and then it blends them basically. Right? So this is what a multi mesh looks like. And obviously we went from something that was 60, 70 FPS to 30. That is a huge, huge difference. So that's something you could consider. And the final test here, and this is the one we're actually going to look at some code for, is the rendering server. Now, we can generate rendering server instances in a tool script, but it gets a little sketchy. So basically, when you generate rendering server instances inside the editor, it actually, it'll show those rendering instances on every single scene that you have open. So that might not be entirely ideal. So, so like I said, rendering server and tool scripts, it works but it's, it can be a little bit sketchy. So I'm going to clear those and hopefully they clear from this screen here too, which they did. And when we start up this script, it's actually going to generate all those instances and we can take a look at the performance. 
So once again, same scene, we're getting 60 FPS, around 20 million triangles. Um, the process time is kind of hanging around there, around 16 to 20 milliseconds. But yeah, this is much more stable. We're, we're well north of 60 FPS. Everything is kind of doing its thing, chugging along. Um, and we kind of hit a baseline of perhaps about 60 here, which is doable. It's not great, but this is kind of just, this is what 22 million triangles looks like, right? When you can't reduce that any further, that's what this looks like. So obviously there wasn't a major difference between the, the nodes case and uh, the rendering server. There's a big difference in the editor, by the way. Um, when you when you run around in the editor here in this nodes scene, of course we have 400 nodes here on the left. Uh, it once again, I'm not sure if the frame rate of the recording is capturing it, but it is. It's pretty slow. It's pretty kind of choppy. Whereas the rendering server, this is more or less instant. I don't see any lag here, whatever. And that makes sense, right? Like in the editor, there's no nodes here. We're not managing all the overhead associated with the scene tree, so we skip that. So if we take a look at the code, it's uh, it's really quite simple. Um, let's just look at this generate buildings um, function that I have here. The only thing you really need to notice is that we have an array of RIDs, okay? So resource IDs. And then to use the rendering server, I've just got this loop here that's gonna go create a 20 by 20 kind of grid. And then we populate those RIDs. So pre-allocating is probably a good idea, um, especially if you're dealing with like tens of thousands of instances. And you just create the instance on the rendering server. You set the base. So in this case, I have this mesh uh, building 15 that we're going to grab the RID from. We set the base. So that actually just sets the mesh of the uh, instance. We set the scenario, which is this is why it's a bit weird in the editor because the world 3D, of course, is the editor's world 3D. And then that kind of transfers over to other scenes. So you get some a little bit weird behavior when you use the rendering server inside a tool script. And then finally, we just set the transform and that's it. So very, very similar in principle to a, a multi mesh, but now you have to manage this information. So, and of course we can remove the buildings by um, doing freeing the RID. So this totally removes it from memory as well. This is not just hiding it. And then you have like a whole bunch of other functions that are available to you. So instance um, set Visibility, right? Set visible. Basically, all of the properties that you see in a mesh instance 3D, you can set on a rendering server here as well. But once again, you really need to keep that image in your mind of we're only sending it information. We're not receiving information from the rendering server. So uh, we need to be mindful of that. But anyways, that's it uh, for this video. I just wanted to drop this real quick video showing that, you know, the rendering server, it's not that complicated to use um, when you're rendering lots and lots and lots of things. It's definitely something to consider. And uh, let me know what you think. If you want to see a video on manual LOD and how that might fit into this paradigm, uh, I'd be happy to make something like that. I just got to put a little bit of time and effort into how I want to present that. But yeah, thanks for watching and I'll, uh, I'll see you in the next one.